Nathan Bauer, who comes to us via the Great White North, as he puts it, um, also known as Canada. Um, he has BAs in history and philosophy from the University of Calgary and McGill University, respectively. He received a PhD in philosophy from the University of Chicago in 2008. And since then, he's published articles on Kant's theoretical philosophy and inquiry and the British Journal for the History of Philosophy. And he's working on some others. Maybe even they've even come out, I think, more recently. A Plato paper. There's a Plato paper, too. That's right. Um, and he, in fact, is, is working on some other sort of things besides Kant, but today he's going to speak to us about Kant, which is his major area of scholarship. And in fact, the title of the talk is, as we see here, The Consequences of Care, a Kantian Reconstruction. And I would like to ask all of you to join me in welcoming Professor Bauer. Hey. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so a few things before I get started. So first, uh, I kind of begged Ed to do a last minute change to the poster. So this is my second favorite painting, and so I wanted to get it into it. Uh, yeah, uh, so I now feel obliged to sort of refer to it. So you should brace yourself for all sorts of strained architectural metaphors in this talk. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say uh, is, well, so what I'm trying to do with this talk is basically try to secure the foundations of Kant's ethical theory and then to sort of rebuild some parts of it that I don't like quite as well. Uh, so it's sort of foundational work in Kant's ethics. Uh, I'm gonna make this totally free of jargon, so there's not gonna be any Kantian language at all, no categorical imperatives or any of that stuff, uh, but I think it at least captures uh, some of what Kant is trying to do in his account. And then the, I guess the other thing to say, uh, Feel free to stop me along the way if anything I'm saying is unclear. Like, so if just questions of clarification, you know, just put up your hand and we'll stop and make sure it's clear along the way. Uh, but please save your decisive refutations until after the talk. <clears throat> All right, let's start. Let's see if this works. All right, good, it works. Uh, so I'm going to start with two questions uh, that will sort of guide this talk. Uh, so the first question. Why be moral? A very basic question. Uh, and this is a very traditional worry about sort of philosophical or moral skepticism. So for example, if I ask you to stop stealing uh, my lunch from the office fridge, you might say, I don't care, I just do what I want, right? Uh, and at that point, uh, I guess the question is, what can I say to convince you uh, that you should follow this moral rule against lunch theft? How do I sort of show that, uh, uh, the source of, of these moral obligations. Where do they come from and how can I sort of make them uh, uh, feel obligatory to you, right? So that's the sort of question we're dealing with here. Uh, philosophers have given quite a few different answers to this question, trying to answer this why be moral question. And so at some point I will talk about appeals to empirical consequences as a way of sort of thinking about this uh, as, and as a sort of source of moral obligation or that approach. I'll talk a little bit about that, but I'll spend much more time talking about how Kant thinks about this, which is focusing in on duties as sort of derived from our rational nature, so to the rational side of us. And he thinks that's the best way to answer that question. Uh, so that'll be our main focus, but along the way we will be looking at a second question, uh, which might sound a little bit odd, but the question is how situated is ethics? And by that I mean, how much do the particulars of our situation, like the social context in which things are happening, how much does that matter for uh, morality and sort of moral assessments? Uh, so a lot of contemporary ethicists think that we need to be more attuned to these sort of particular social contexts, uh, and that we should avoid these sort of overarching universal moral claims that are meant to apply to any situation whatsoever, right? Uh, and Kant, I think is rightly seen as the sort of arch rival of that sort of situated ethics. For him, it's all about the sort of universal moral claims. Uh, and his worry is that, or one of his worries is that if ethics is overly situated, uh, <clears throat> there's this fear that we're, you're sort of undermining our ability to, uh, to judge certain situations as wrong. Like, like it sort of undermines something important that morality is meant to do. Uh, so for example, if ethics is totally situated and context dependent, 
How can we judge other social situations or contexts? How can we say stuff like slavery is wrong? Uh, those, those are the sort of fears that are motivating Kant, right? And I think sometimes Kant is overly worried about that stuff, but, but that's what's sort of working in the background there. So Kant thinks we need to be able to make these universal moral claims that cut across all human contexts to avoid a kind of moral relativism uh, where we just end up saying anything goes or, or something to that effect. So my main focus will be on the first question, but as we sort of work through that, uh, we will end up sort of saying some things about the second as well. There'll be sort of connection there. All right. So start with the first question, why be moral? And in particular, I'm actually not gonna start with Kant. I wanna start with a different moral philosopher, uh, John Stuart Mill. Here he comes. There he is. Uh, <coughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's all about the animations. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> no, no, he's the bad guy. <laughs> Can't you tell? Uh, uh, so Mill is a consequentialist, uh, so he believes that uh, the moral value of an action is based on sort of measuring its consequences or utility or something like that, how much it contributes or detracts from human happiness. Uh, and so for consequentialists, we could rephrase this initial question. We could ask something like, why should I care about maximizing the happiness or the utility of humanity, right? Uh, and this is a question Mill raises. So in this first quotation, he, he, he says, uh, why am I bound to promote the general happiness? If my own happiness lies in something else, why may I not give that the preference? So why can't I just take care of myself? Why do I have to care about you know, promoting the good, the good of humanity in some way, right? Uh, and here's the answer he gives to that question in the second quote. So he says, what is the sanction of that particular standard? We may answer the same as all is of all other moral standards, the conscientious feelings of mankind. Uh, so Mill's answer to this question is why be moral is something like, uh, we have this general feeling of goodwill towards humanity, and that's what sort of motivates and grounds all sorts of these sorts of moral claims, why we have to care about maximizing the consequences or something like that. Uh, so it's, in short, it's because it's based on a feeling, right? Uh, and this is a pretty common response, especially from this area of moral philosophy. So David Hume, uh, before Mill, says something sort of similar to that, that humans share some sort of universal feeling of benevolence, just goodwill towards others, and that's what grounds all of our sort of moral duties and, and uh, moral actions. It's just some sort of feeling of goodwill. Uh, and Kant thinks this is a terrible answer to the why be moral question. Here comes Kant, wait for it, there he is. Uh, <clears throat> so Kant's thought is feelings are far too unreliable to sort of serve as a foundation for morality because they seem to vary a great deal from person to person. Not everyone has this feeling of goodwill towards others or benevolence. And the thought is that's just sort of, it's just not reliable enough to work for morality. So Kant thinks, uh, oh, and it's worth pointing out, even some of these people that claim that there is a sort of universal feeling of goodwill towards humans did not really uh, exercise it very clearly in their own lives. So David Hume, for instance, was a pretty horrific racist and pretty clearly had no sense of benevolence to a great deal of humanity. Uh, uh, and that's something to worry about, right? That's sort of Kant's, precisely Kant's concern is that feelings are not universal in that way, right? And morality, he thinks, should be. Uh, so instead, Kant thinks reason should serve as our foundation for morality. That's a pretty basic feature of Kant's thought. Uh, and there are some advantages of this approach. I'm not gonna go into this in any detail, but uh, one thing is it does show something interesting. Uh, we don't hold non-rational animals morally responsible for their actions. It's kind of weird to morally blame your dog for doing something. and and, and Kant has a nice sort of story to tell about that because animals seem to have a lot of feelings, right? That it seems some, somewhat similar to human feelings, uh, but they don't have reason in the way that we do. And so there's a nice story we could tell about why we don't morally judge animals in the way that we do other humans, right? And that's, that's I think, part of what's motivating Kant's rationalism here. Uh, 
Another way of putting that is to say that uh, non-rational beings are kind of enslaved to their desires. They act on whatever desires are strongest, whereas humans or rational humans have this find in themselves this capacity to sort of step back and question their desires, to sort of interrogate them and say, should I really be acting on this desire? That's a very distinctly human sort of capacity, uh, and Kant sees that as linked to our rational nature, right? That we can sort of step back and question these things. Uh, another way of saying that is to say that humans are free. Uh, freedom for Kant is precisely this irrational ability to question and to sort of step back from your desires. Uh, and I think that's not a bad way of thinking about freedom. All right. Uh, Again, I'm not going to defend that rational foundation. I'm just sort of laying out this is sort of Kant's approach to this. Uh, instead, I'm going to ask the question, uh, if we assume that sort of rational foundation, how much can we do with that? What can we build from that rational foundation in terms of a broader ethical theory? Uh, and this will be the place where I both want to sort of draw upon Kant and also tweak and correct him uh, to some extent. All right, so let's see what we can do with this. Very bleached out. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, so again, Kant's idea is we don't need a feeling of goodwill to be moral. Uh, it might be nice to have, but it's not essential. Being moral is really based on our rational nature. Uh, so that's going to be our foundation here. Uh, so there's our foundation. And Kant's thought is through reason alone, we can determine right from wrong. That it sort of provides that uh, power to make those determinations. Uh, and here the crucial concept for Kant is the idea of a rationally consistent will. Consistency is a really vital feature here of his account. Uh, so the will is just the part of your mind that decides what to do. It sort of makes choices and acts on them. So it's, it's distinguished from the part of your mind that's out going out seeking knowledge, right? Uh, and so uh, being rationally consistent just means it's just a form of logical consistency. All the different sort of motivational beliefs in your will are rationally consistent. That's, that's sort of what we're looking for here. Uh, and it's analogous to the logical consistency in other parts of our mental life. Uh, so when you hold inconsistent beliefs, the thought is you're failing as a knower or as a thinker, right? And likewise, Kant wants to say when you are holding inconsistent motivations for action that sort of conflict with one another, that's when you failed as a doer or as a moral agent, right? So it's really, he's really just looking for failures of consistency in what's going on in your mind. Uh, and to sort of put those in moral terms, because that's what he's trying to do with this, a, a way of thinking about this is, in most cases, Kant thinks that being immoral results from trying to make an exception of yourself. Uh, so you think everyone should follow some rule, but you don't think you should have to follow that rule. And the thought is, there's some sort of logical inconsistency there. You have, on the one hand, you believe everyone should do X. On the other hand, you believe I don't have to do X. Uh, and those two beliefs don't fit together, right? And so the immorality comes from holding both of those at the same time. It's a, just a failure of rationality. Uh, so that's the sense in which this is really meant to be derived directly from our rational nature. Uh, all right, so that's the basic approach. And then what Kant does is he wants uh, to establish a series of duties uh, based on this sort of, it's almost like a test. You test whether a proposed principle of action passes the consistency test. Is it sort of something I could co coherently hold or believe in my will, right? And he uses this test to build up a sy system of duties. Uh, so for example, you want to help those who are worse off. He thinks that's one of our duties. Uh, you want to perfect your own talents. This seems to be a particularly important one for Kant. He doesn't want you to be a slacker. He wants you to be out doing stuff all the time. Uh, an important one, don't kill yourself. Another important one for Kant. And maybe more important than anything for Kant, uh, don't lie. Uh, <coughs> uh, that's the one he really hates. Uh, and, and goes on about quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, again, this is not meant to be a complete list or anything. This is sort of the list he works through in the groundwork in his first sort of important ethical work. Uh, he thinks there's many more duties than that, but this is meant to be a representative sample. It's a slightly weird list because it really reflects 
Kant's own moral fixations as much as anything. Uh, uh, but the key point for us is that, is this idea that the particular moral duties are going to be those that would be sort of endorsed by a rationally consistent will, right? It all comes back to that rational consistency. Uh, so for example, consider the duty uh, not to steal, right? So go back to that person that's stealing my lunch from the office fridge. Uh, when you do that, you're basically saying, by, by through that action, you're showing that you believe that it's okay for you to steal my lunch, right? Uh, but despite that, it likely turns out that you don't want everyone to be going around stealing stuff. And if I went and stole uh, like your red swing line stapler, uh, you probably wouldn't like that, right? Uh, in other words, you simultaneously believe that people shouldn't steal and that it's okay if I steal, right? So you're engaged in, your will is rationally inconsistent and that's the sense in which uh, you were doing something immoral in that moment, again. So there we have a particular duty being derived from this notion of rational consistency. Good so far? <clears throat> All right. That's the positive side. Uh, so now I want to look at some places where uh, things go awry a little bit for Kant, I think. Uh, so I think I'm pretty sympathetic to the basic view about rational consistency being the foundation of ethics. I think that works. Uh, but there are some issues, uh, and we'll look at a few of these. Uh, so I've sort of already hinted at this a little bit, but some of the particular duties he tries to derive from this notion of rational consistency seem a little bit just sketchy. Uh, and the line has never seemed particularly convincing to me. People talk about it all the time. but, but uh, so Kant wants to say something like, uh, lying fails this rational consistency test because the idea of a world in which everyone lies is just incoherent. Because lies wouldn't have any sort of, no one would believe any lies if everyone was lying, right? So he thinks that just, it's an impossible situation almost, right? Uh, and I don't know, maybe that is an impossible situation, but it never really seemed like a failure of consistency in the way that, uh, I don't know, it doesn't seem to have the moral weight. Like, like I can tell the story about the stealing situation and see how, oh yeah, you're making an exception of yourself. We could tell a story about why that sort of uh, would have that sort of moral weight, right? You're treating yourself special and you're, you're not holding yourself to the same rules you hold other people to. Here there's not really that same aspect of it. He's just thinking that there's a Everyone lying is an impossible situation, and therefore it's irrational, or something like that. And so that just never seemed particularly convincing to me. Uh, after all, there are lots of things uh, that wouldn't work if everyone did them, like uh, Rowan University wouldn't work if everyone was a professional philosopher. Uh, nothing would work if everyone was a professional philosopher, right? Uh, I don't think that means that uh, uh, it's bad, morally bad for me to be a professional philosopher, right? So there's, there's sort of some failure, failures of universality that don't seem relevant in quite the same way. Uh, so we can go into that into more detail, but I just think some of these derivations uh, are not as convincing as they could be. Uh, but the bigger worry for me is this issue of conflicts of duty. This is a big problem for Kant, uh, and I've never really seen a good answer to this. So on Kant's theory, all of our duties have this character of being sort of either on or off. They can flip on or off. Either you have a duty not to steal or it's okay to steal. There's not really any room for middle ground on Kant's account because the test is, is it rationally consistent or not? And either something is rationally consistent or it's not rationally consistent. There's not really, you can't be like half consistent, right? So there's no sort of middle ground there. Uh, and that means that there's no way of measuring the strength of a duty. You either have a duty to do something or to avoid something, or you don't have that duty, right? And there's no middle ground there. Uh, and that creates a problem if we have duties pushing us in different directions, right? Uh, uh, the classic case, uh, we've talked lots about this, that Kant gets confronted with is, uh, the murderer comes to your house, knocks on your door, and says, I'm going to kill so-and-so, are they home? Right? Uh, 
seems like the right answer is to say, no, they're not home there, right, uh, at minimum. Uh, Kant cannot take that sort of easy answer because for him, we have a duty not to lie and there's no way of saying it's any weaker than the duty to prevent murders from happening, right? Uh, because both would be failures of rational consistency and there's really nothing more he could say at that point, right? Uh, and so he does all sorts of weird things trying to avoid these scenarios. Basically, he tries to convince himself that conflicts of duty never actually happen. Uh, and I think he's just wrong about that. I, I think this is just Kant in a tough place. He just does not really have a mechanism for dealing with conflicts of duty. And I've never really seen a good answer to that uh, problem for him. So it seems to me we need some way of, of giving a kind of weight to these duties so that we can compare them. And when we're in a sort of conflicted situation, we could say, uh, well, you know, yeah, lying's bad, but it, it's much better here than letting this person get murdered, right? So it seems like there should be easy answers to this. So the question is, how, what can we do with Kant's basic account to allow those sorts of, uh, that way of dealing with conflicts of duty? That's sort of what I'm hoping to find here. So I guess uh, part of my diagnosis of what's going wrong with Kant's account is that he is uh, relying too much on reason alone. And this is sort of a place where, where he's getting in trouble here. Uh, so my thought is reason has to be an important part of his account. He's a rational philosopher, but there's no, uh, I think there's a way that we can introduce an appeal to empirical consequences, the sort of stuff Mill and Hume talked about uh, that would work sort of in conjunction with his rationally derived duties. So that's my sort of goal is to bring these two aspects together. And it's actually slightly weird that Kant thinks that reason alone would be the source of all our moral duties. Because in other areas of his philosophy, he doesn't think that. So when he's talking about how we acquire knowledge, for example, he thinks that knowledge is always the product of the rational side of us working together with sort of the sensible empirical side of us. So we have the sort of sensible faculties that, or capacities that bring in data, and then the rational side is bringing order and unity to it. It's the cooperation of these two that makes knowledge possible. And it seems to me he should be doing something similar here, right? Uh, where we could have uh, the cooperation between the sort of rationally derived uh, duty, general duties, uh, so some sort of appeal to rational consistency, but also some sort of appeal to empirical consequences. And if we can bring those together in a fairly harmonious way, I think we end up in a better place. Uh, so that's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to make some adjustments to Kant's theory. Uh, and my approach will be to zero in on what I think is the strongest part of his account, which is his derivation of the duty to help others. So I mentioned it briefly previously. Now I want to say a little bit more about this. Uh, so here's his basic thought here. Uh, imagine someone who just does not feel like helping other people in need, right? Uh, or imagine it's me, right? I just don't want to do it, right? I just want to keep my money or whatever, and my time all to myself. And then I'm supposed to ask myself, uh, could I live my life this way? Could I live by this rule and still be rationally consistent, right? Could I, can this sort of way of life pass the rational consistency test? And Kant says, no. He thinks this would be a failure of consistency. And the reason he thinks that is because all of us are finite and limited in power. Uh, basically, that's his way of saying we're not God. We're not all powerful. Uh, we're finite. We're, we're prone to death and that sort of thing. Uh, and that means that we can all easily imagine situations in which we would call upon and need the help of others. It's just sort of built into being a human, finite, rational being, right? That we're dependent on others, or at least we can imagine those situations, right? So, for example, uh, Imagine I fall down a well, right, I'm calling for help, and then I can hear the people up top who are just sort of sitting looking down and sort of telling jokes and just ignoring my calls for help, right? Uh, in that situation, whatever I thought about sort of helping others before, I would feel outraged in that situation. I would feel they should be helping me, right? Uh, and that sort of just falls directly from my sort of finite, rational nature. I need the help of others in certain situations, and now I'm imagining that sort of situation. Uh, and so what this shows is that 
when you're entertaining the thought of not helping others, at the very same time, you still have it in the back of your mind that there's this general rule that people should help others. You just want to make an exception for yourself again. You don't want to have to follow that rule, but you still want it to be the rule because, and you know that because you can imagine situations when you would expect that help, right? So that's the thought in which uh, not helping others would, would involve a failure of consistency, and therefore we have a duty to help others, right? If you recognize that consistency, that's how you recognize that it's sort of morally right to help others. Uh, so I think, I think that's a successful derivation of a duty. I think that that example works much better for Kant than, say, lying. Uh, and I think it's something we could build off in, in important ways here. So I'm going to sort of, uh, I want to sort of make this the sort of fundamental duty of Kant's account. Uh, and I want to give it a new name to sort of reflect this broader role. Uh, so we'll call it the duty of care. Basically, we have a duty uh, to show concern for the well-being of other people, right? Uh, we find in ourselves a need for others to care about our well-being, and thus it would be rationally inconsistent for us not to care for them. Uh, so I want to make that the sort of fundamental duty. Uh, and with this sort of new, more general, rationally derived duty of care in place, now the goal is to figure out uh, how to show care for people in particular situations. And this is where the consequences uh, comes into the picture uh, and becomes morally relevant. So the thought is, it's not enough for me just to care for your well-being in general. Uh, I also need to know what actions will promote your well-being right, or, ca or cause harm to it. Uh, and that inevitably involves considering the possible consequences of my action. Uh, so if I steal your stapler, uh, you won't be able to staple your fancy proposal for a new course, and then the curriculum committee will reject your proposal, and then the dean will be mad at you and you won't get your promotion. I have to trace out all the sort of consequences of these actions to assess uh, the rightness or wrongness of my action, right? Uh, but in another situation, I can imagine stealing your stapler would be actually a form of caring for you, right? So if you've developed this horrible sort of psychotic affliction where you're sort of, I don't know, uh, you can't stop stapling stuff, right? Like sort of addictive stapler or something. Uh, I actually had staple as my example before I even saw this here. So it, it actually worked out perfectly. Uh, uh, in that situation, maybe a good way of showing care for you would precisely be to take the stapler away from you, right? Uh, that, so the same, the, opposite, the same action could be a way of showing care in certain circumstances and not showing care in cer certain circumstances, right? Uh, and so the basic thought is to carry out this duty of care, we must consider the consequences of our actions. It's sort of an inescapable part of, of acting in a moral way. All right, so that's the basic approach, and now I want to talk about a few advantages, why this sort of, this sort of adjustment of Kant, I think, is sort of helpful for him. Uh, so one important advantage is it immediately gives us a pretty easy way of resolving conflicts of duty. Uh, this is we're in a much better situation now for two reasons. One, uh, uh, there's now only one fundamental duty. Kant had this whole system of duties laid out, right? So they're not don't murder, perfect your talents, don't lie, uh, and conflicts are inevitably going to happen between those, right? Well, I just have sort of one fundamental duty, care. Uh, for me, that sort of expresses the basic feature of morality. Uh, act based on care for other people, right? Uh, and uh, so there's no, other, there's no other sort of totally separate duty to conflict with that. Uh, and then, uh, when we are trying to decide how to act on that care, we now have all sorts of resources available for dealing with these sort of tricky situations, right? Uh, so we can assess the consequences of various possible actions to see which ones best sort of uh, accomplish my goal of caring for that person, right? Uh, which ones sort of better express that duty? Uh, and we're, if we're in a situation where we could lie to avoid a murder taking place, this now becomes an easy thing for Kant's account to deal with for, on this revised version, right? You can say, uh, 
the consequences of being lied to are not nearly as bad as the consequences of being murdered, uh, and therefore we have, clearly have a duty to lie if, if doing so will prevent a murder from happening, right? Uh, so what used to be a sort of problem for cons account just sort of goes away uh, with this modification. A second sort of advantage, uh, so this brings us to the second question I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, the idea of ethics as being sort of contextually accentuated. Uh, I think my revision of Kant gives us a little bit more room for that sort of social context to take place. So for example, we could recognize that uh, care can be expressed in more than one way. There's no reason to think that there's only one way of caring for a person, and societies themselves might have diff build up different sort of social systems as expressions of that, and sort of diff different forms of care, basically. Uh, and so they could even develop different care-based moral codes. There's no reason to think there's only one sort of proper way to do that. Uh, and so, for example, uh, if I'm living in a society where the moral system is sort of, the idea of property rights is a, is a sort of fundamental part of that system, then the duty not to steal is going to be fairly important within that society, right? But we can also imagine other social situations uh, that don't have the concept of property, or at least don't put the same weight on that concept. Uh, and, it, and that would be a situation where other aspects of the duty of care would come to the fore, and the, the sort of stealing would not seem to be as important in that situation, right? So we can allow for all sorts of historical and social variation within sort of societal moral codes, uh, all still grounded in this fundamental duty of care. But uh, even though we add that sort of contextual sensitivity, there's no worry that this will collapse into the sort of moral relativism that Kant always feared, right? Uh, uh, because we can say that some societies and some moral codes and some, some social systems are just fundamentally inconsistent with the basic duty of care. That they're just sort of, there's no way of reconciling that with the sort of, the sort of original foundational duty of care. Uh, so societies that engage in institutional systematic racism, uh, that's gonna just be incompatible with this basic notion of care. Uh, or maybe, uh, you know, we can imagine all sorts of social situations where something has gone so wrong that we don't have to say, well, that's just their way of doing things. We can say, no, what you are doing is just violates basic concern for other, for the well-being of humanity in general, right? Uh, and so, uh, so basically there's two ways we can assess actions. We can assess an individual action within, uh, 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 within a particular society's moral code, within its sort of expression of this duty of care, and then we can assess the moral code, code as a whole, is it sort of consistent with this rational duty of care? And so there's sort of two levels that we can, that we can work at here, right? And that allows a little bit of contextual sensitivity, uh, while, while it's meant to be a sort of balance between the universalism Kant's looking for and the contextual sensitivity that uh, seems like a good thing to have in our moral assessments, right? So I want to look at the big picture for a moment. Uh, uh, this is really big picture. So philosophy does not make steady progress like the sciences. We tend to return to the great questions again and again, rebuilding on old foundations. Uh, and I see Kant's duty to help others and my expansion of this into a general duty of care as an example of this, because basically it's a version of the social contract. Uh, we collectively recognize that we cannot achieve happiness on our own. And so any reasonable person will recognize that selfishness, lack of care, is inconsistent with this goal. And they'll then thus see themselves as obliged to care for one another, regardless of their individual sentiments. Uh, this is old. This is way older than Kant. Uh, this is a form of moral theorizing whose roots go back uh, to as long as philosophy has been practice. Uh, uh, back to that first question I asked, why be moral? Probably the first answer to that question, uh, or the first or oldest I know of, is because God says so, right? Uh, that's sort of the traditional response. Uh, this is exactly the response tired parents give to their kids when they won't do their chores or something like that, and about as effective as that response. 
so divine command theory, I don't think has too many contemporary adherents. Uh, the first interesting, I think, answer to the why be moral question, or the oldest I know of at least, comes from Plato uh, in Book Two of the Republic. Uh, so there he answers the moral skeptic who has these doubts about moral obligation, who believes that we should only care for ourselves. And his reply is basically that humans are socially dependent on one another for our, our flourishing. Uh, we can thrive only when we come together to form a mutually supported community, a polis or a city in his terms, uh, and any rational person will recognize this truth about us, right? Uh, so then in the end, that's really not so different what I've been saying in this talk and what I've been sort of uh, imputing to Kant. So in short, we have a rational duty to care about the consequences of our actions for others. That's it. That's what Kant should have said. Thanks. <clears throat> So I guess the natural question, especially with you mentioning Plato at the end, is how Kantian are we still being? Yeah. It seems like we kind of had to say, like, yeah, we should have a rational foundation rather than this kind of feelings-based foundation from morality, which doesn't seem particularly unique to Kant or his thought. It seems like it seems like even Plato is kind of aware, yeah, we're going to need a, a rational foundation for this. And I think he almost like goes out of his way to say so, if I remember correctly, like in the Phaedo, he says, like, yeah, divine command theory doesn't work because if God's commands are good, it's because he's good for some rational reasons. So then it seems like, I just, I can't see the ways in which this is Kantian anymore. It seems like Kant's contributions are these kinds of, the str in some bits, the strange parts that yes. make very little sense. Yeah. So, so if the question is, if Kant were here today, would he be like, oh, this is awesome? No, <laughs> probably not. Uh, so, so it's, so it's not just, I guess, a friendly amendment to Kant in the sense that he could take all of this easily on board, right? Uh, because, I mean, he had access, uh, he had written all this consequentialist stuff already, so if he'd wanted to do it, he could have done it, right? Uh, so it was already out there available to him. Uh, so, so yeah, it's more than, it's, it's more than just, uh, uh, yeah, it's more than just a tweak of Kant, but, uh, but I think, the rational foundation is really important. And most consequential, I don't know of any consequentialists that think that ethics has a rational foundation. So it is a combination that I haven't encountered before. Now I'll probably at some point find someone who's done this, right, because it's philosophy, <laughs> they've been doing this forever. Uh, but I haven't seen it yet, and it's certainly not a prominent view. And so if it works, I think it's kind of neat, because you get some of the advantages of Kant and then you get some of the advantage, you avoid some of the disadvantages, or the weirdness. Uh, so that's the sort of goal. But I think you're right on one level, yeah, Kant would probably hate this. Lovely talk, Dr. Bauer. Um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, it seems like in circumventing the issues with Kant's deontology, you're, you're kind of stumbling into the, the issues with consequentialism. Like, it wouldn't be very difficult for me to construct a, a, a uh, a situation where like I want to steal from somebody and I or I want to beat the snot out of them and I say like oh I get what I want and then I teach them a lesson and I'm sure they'll go on to to practice like to employ this lesson they've learned and be a, a real big shot now that they've got tougher skin or whatever so uh, it, it seems like like now we're instead of like a duty-based ethic it's more like we're only able to judge things uh, retrospectively so what do you what do you think about that well I mean so, so the first thing, you're totally right that I've now inherited all the problems with consequentialism, right? And, and there's a long, ongoing debate about that, right? Uh, and I'm not enough of an expert on consequentialism to be able to say, oh, but I've, I've got all the answers to that, right? But on the other hand, it's a thriving research program, so people think, enough people think that something like that can work. And it, for me, it feels impossible that we don't look at the consequences. I, I just cannot imagine living a moral life without doing that. Like, like that's the part of Kant, I'm, I'm pretty fond of Kant, like in a lot of ways, but that part of it always just seems sort of bizarre to me. Uh, now, about the retroactive thing, so it's true you, let me make sure if I understand, but it's true that you will not fully know the consequences of your actions until after the fact, right? right? But we can assess someone based on did they do the right thing given what they expected to happen? So we could, we could judge them based on expected outcomes. And so it's true that, you know, uh, 
you know, I stealed the stapler from you and it turns out it has like a hidden treasure inside and how could I have known that, right? Uh, but but you, I feel like you can only be judged on what you could reasonably have expected the outcome to be. And so we could sort of build that into the theory as well. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's, I have the same issue I always have with Kant. And so I have it with this too, that the absence of emotion yes. and how we, for example, even you're choosing the concept of care as a primary duty, that, that's an emotional decision. That, that is a metaphysical concept you've chosen to use as a way to judge. But, but there is, and, and in terms of consequences, that too is an emotional decision. So again, I get stuck with much of philosophy, as you well know, <laughs> with this relegation of emotions to a bottom level in terms of how we act. And I find that here too. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm totally opposed to that concern you're raising. Like, like, like this, uh, the sort of role of the emotions in our moral lives, uh, I always feel sort of ambivalent about this. Because on the one hand, they te seem terribly unreliable, right? They the, are. Uh, and it, they do seem pretty, it seems like, it seems like a very insecure foundation, right? Uh, so. On the other hand, I don't want to go as far as Kant in saying, you know, Kant says these strange things like, you're only really truly moral when you take no joy in doing the right thing at all, right? Uh, and, you know, people try to deal with these passages, but they're there and then they're, it's weird, right? Because it feels like you should enjoy doing the right thing, right? That's part of being a good human being is, is to, you know, to, to have that sort of emotional side of it, right? Uh, but, but, but even in judging, our emotions are coming into play. Uh, you know, it, it's our rationality. We don't really know why we're thinking what we're thinking half the time. There's an emotional underpinning that we are frequently unaware of. And it impacts our rational thinking, even the pieces we're choosing to look at when we make those choices. You know, should I marry this man? Shouldn't I marry this man, right? And then, you know, you make your columns, A, B, C. And it's really an emotional evaluation that we claim as being rational. So I, I always have this problem of, of where, what is rationality really? Yeah, I mean, so, if you do not believe that humans have a rational nature, then you're not going to like this account, right? Uh, but I mean, Kant doesn't think that we're these purely rational creatures either. Like Kant is very attuned to the fact that we are deeply irrational, right? Like, and he stresses this all the time that uh, we don't always do the right thing, right? Like morality would be easy if we just had reason and just did our thing, but we, we're constantly failing, right? And Kant thinks that we are constantly failing. And so for him, uh, what reason does is just tells you what you should be doing, and it, it gives some moral weight to that so that you feel some compulsion. But it's not like it's so overwhelming that you always do the right thing. And so we have these sort of complicated emotional lives that constantly interfere with this, right? And, and Kant is totally on board with all that happening. He just thinks that we should, he hopes that the rational side wins out, right? So, so this is partly just a story of how rationality determines what the right thing to do is. And then there's a further story, how is it that we end up doing the right thing? How, where do we get that sort of mo motivational weight from all of this, right? Uh, and that, that is tricky, right? But Kant does think that reason is, does provide some impulse in us. And it happens on like other parts of our life, it seems less controversial. controversial. Like if you see that two things are logically inconsistent, most people will adjust their beliefs. Like, like it has some sort of bearing on them. I'm not saying in every case, but it, it, it's a factor. People don't like to hold inconsistent beliefs and they'll try to do all sorts of weird things to escape that situation, right? Uh, and all I'm saying is something similar happens in our moral lives, right? Well, I don't agree with you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You're very comfortable with having inconsistent beliefes. I mean, I could be uh, pro pro life and and pro the executing 
a person. Yeah, but people, uh, try so to, the, people the, will try to still tell a story about how those beliefs are actually consistent in that situation. I know. Which means they care about consistency, okay. right? Uh, so I think it is important to people. It's true that they'll play all sorts of games to sort of make it feel consistent when maybe it really isn't. That happens. Right. But even that shows that we care about consistency, the fact that we bother to play that game. We don't usually try to say things that are blatantly inconsistent and just oh, say I'm, I'm, Oh, I agree with that. Yeah. We, we want to seem consistent, and we certainly can spin a story. Well, that means we care to about To make it. ourselves consistent. But yeah. I'm sure that there are other people here who want to talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mine is related. Yeah in the following way, um, one of mine. I feel like when, when you answered and said, look, people care about some degree of, you know, the point you're making, the, the, uh, Kant is, is concerned, doesn't think that people should care at all about you know, being happy when they're doing the right thing. Right. right. And this sort of reminded me, so, so one of the questions that I have, right, is you want to put care in the position of a kind of primary, primary moral imperative. Okay, cool. Um, but if you're going to do that, then I feel like you're actually still missing important, really an entire important chunk of what even Kant recognizes as the body of the duties. And what somebody like Aristotle, for instance, would actually recognize as the core and as a core and foundational piece of what ethical life is supposed to be about, mm -hmm. um, which is precisely so. In Kant's case, it's the question of the duties to self, right? Um, and in Aristotle's case, it would be something like the question of, well, okay, if we're going to talk about a good life, we not only have to talk about me doing the right thing, but we have to talk about me being able to live with doing the right thing in a way that it doesn't just make me miserable. Right. So, so you know, Aristotle's goal is not only to, is to get you to actually do the right thing in a way that you can also feel like you're flourishing. Yeah. Right. It's not. It's not. It's not. You know. It's not just to make you flourish, no matter what you do. Right. But, but so, so the, I guess the point I want to push you on is the question of of how do you deal with, how do you get, that whole dimension of kind of like self cultivation back. Right. If you okay. if you put it all on care, all on other directed duties. So. So I'm going to try to do an easy answer and, then, and see if I can get away with that. Because my, my first thought is just what you have a duty to care for is all humanity. You are part of humanity, so you have a duty to care for yourself, just as sort of part of that collective. So it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be other focused. It is more than just yourself, but it doesn't have to be exclusively and not including yourself, right? Uh, and I think that should be enough to get duties toward yourself sort of derivative duties toward yourself. Like, so you do have a duty to promote your own happiness, right? As well as the happiness of others. Which, by the way, Kant also says. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, that's cool. Um, I, th I thought you'd say something like that, but I thought it was worth yeah. raising. Yeah. And, and I'm no, it's true, because the language of care could suggest that it's all other directed, and it, it yeah. doesn't need to be. I OK. Yeah. Uh, I like many of your uh, Parts approach is try to reconcile uh, rationalism and uh, uh, empiricism, consequentialism. <laughs> but of course, it, it may <coughs> bring uh, problems. I agree with you. My question, uh, first question, will be: uh, You say uh, ethics of care, consequence of care, yeah. and you acknowledge it. as long as we practice care we face situations because care means your relationship with others and that kind of relationship is always in various different situations so here uh, i always feel even under the same principle of care caring for others the meaning of caring or the way of caring will be very much different yeah. Therefore, uh, to what a great extent, to what a degree, this kind of universal rationalist principle will make a sense. There's still a kind of question related to relativity or ration, uh, relativism. Right. Yeah. Some scholars like uh, in this country, like uh, 
uh, David Wong, you know, uh, 1984 spoke on moral relativity. Mm. And recently, he, 2006, he published uh, Pluralistic Relativism, which means constraint relativism. Yeah. That's sort of what so, I So, oh, okay. <laughs> so not too far from. So I, but but I mean, uh, I he details, argues but. that, uh, like a care, a, a Chinese woman, her uh, daughter grew up in America, but uh, mother's value to care will not uh, respect uh, too much privacy. Right. She will uh, look at the daughter's everything, very, you know, interfering with, involving uh, educating daughter. But the daughter grew up in America ha has different moral values. That's my privacy. How can, how do, how dare you touch my letter without uh, consulting? Yeah. Right, me first. So, uh, Dr. Wang uh, talk about that uh, there are different values functioning in different societies, uh, groups. So they are relevant, but uh, they may they try to compromise with Kantian uh, universalism. They may share certain things in common. Yeah. So if there is certain things in common, we don't deny that. So that will facilitate uh, each group. Uh, to be in a better relationship with each other, understand each other, yeah, or reduce conflict, uh, like like you say, conflict of duties, probably influenced by conflict of conscious uh, value systems situations. Yeah. So uh, my question is still that uh, the universal rationalism, universalism still face a lot of challenges here. So, um, so I think my view is similar to that. So I, I do want a kind of pluralism where different societies can have different ways of, I don't know, enacting care or expressing care, right? And, and there's no reason to think there's one, only a single correct way to do it. So it's pluralistic in, in that sense. But it's still the universal part, it's like- But you want to keep that a universal- Well, I want something to- Rational principle that's caring for others. So there's care in general, and then there's different, thank you. <laughs> Society A and B and C, and they're all, di they have variations, but they're all consistent with the basic duty for care, meaning Everyone in that society, their concerns are sort of addressed by that moral code, or sort of taken seriously in that moral code, even though there's sort of differences here, right? Whereas there will be other moral codes that are just fundamentally inconsistent with care, right? So, so the Nazis or the American slaveholders, or whatever, there's gonna be all these sort of systems and some clearly closer to home that are uh, inconsistent with the basic duty for care, right? So it's pluralistic, but there's a limits. Right, you can't sort of go beyond certain limits because then you sort of violate the duty for care, uh, and that's why the universalism is important. It like puts a constraint on different possible moral codes. Uh, so it sounds sort of similar. Uh, but there could be some differences. So this is which one yeah. is rule deontology. But uh, you will you will stay yeah. away. <laughs> you will stay away from re uh, relativism. You will stay more close with universalism. Well, with a little bit of pluralistic I'll try social to variation. compromising yeah. somehow. It's like constrained pluralism. Constrained. There's my, there's my phrase. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for all yeah. that. <laughs> all right, so. You wanna? I just, so I just wanted to ask Nathan how yeah. he responded to this comment that I was making that um, care is instinctual. We find it in, in animals giving birth, in cleaning their, their offspring, in the herd coming together. So care is not per se rational. Why couldn't it be both? Well, it can be both, but I just want to say it in and of itself, it need yeah. not be a rational behavior. It can certainly simply be yeah. instinctual. Because so I'm not- Human beings don't do anything that instinctual. I mean, that's actually part of, what, part of the difference in what, how human beings cast out their world. As, as rational beings, or as, as cognitive beings, right, than, than, than say an animal that doesn't have much, you know, as much cognitive variation as responses to the world because it's mostly programmed by instincts. I mean, this is actually what, what sort of biology has been telling us about how these things work for 
at least a century. <laughs> that there are differences, you know, even among animals in terms of how much of their stuff is expressed and determined by hard coded instincts. I mean, Sorry. <laughs> if we're dealing with mammals, there, there's a lot of social stuff right. going on at that level that's yeah. not instinctual, right? right? But uh, 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 we should ask the biologist. <laughs> we got a biologist here? Yeah. Oh, okay. He's like, oh, God. <laughs> 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 before before we pet stir our biologist, it seems that we mean rational here in a different sense than we do when we're talking about like, making a rational versus emotional decision. It seems like the rationality here is not, I need to be like thinking with certain kinds of faculties. It just needs to be that if I were to ever go inspect this, it would hold up. Would I, don't, I don't need that's to right. ever actually inspect yes. it. That's, that's if right. it ends up being the case that if I were to ever look, it'd be fine. Yeah, it's like a test. Uh, uh, now, but Khan also thinks that if you did not have that power of rationality, you would never acquire that moral status in the first place. So it's, it's the way I think about it is. Uh, well, if I couldn't look, see it was wrong, and change it, I couldn't be held responsible. That's right. So it seems like I'm fine as long as, if I were ever inspect, I wouldn't change things. That's right, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, way, the way Plato views this is, might be actually helpful here. Like, like, Plato is very attuned to us being both emotional and rational beings. And those are both important. They both have their important place in our lives, right? And so more than Kant, he thinks that to be a fully functioning human, you need both together. But he does think reason has to be on the top, meaning it has to be uh, all of your emotions and desires have to be sort of rationally constrained. And over time, you train your emotions, right? So young infants have all sorts of crazy emotions, right? Uh, and through a sort of socializing process and through acquiring rationality, uh, you put limits on that, what it's okay to want and what you shouldn't want, right? Uh, and so it's sort of, at some point, if your emotions are properly trained, you don't need to sort of constantly test them. You'll just sort of in be inclined to do the right thing and you'll just enjoy caring for other people, right? All the, they, all, they all come to the same place. That's, that's where philosophy goes. The question, how Kantian is this position? It seems like a lot of this somewhat idea, Kantian. <laughs> it seems like, in some sense, it's like basic idea of care. Like, if I really wanted to, it seems like, even if I don't want to go back to the ancient Greeks, I can. It seems like fairly explicit, like in the Sermon on the Mount, that like, yeah, we're gonna, you're gonna love your neighbor as you love yourself, and this kind of yeah. everyone is the same. Of course, they do it like before God, but this kind of basic intuition seems. Yeah. So way my, broader than Kant. So my view of the history of philosophy is that. All the great philosophers are climbing the same mountain from different directions, and they're heading towards the same place. Uh, and, and, and so, yeah, it shouldn't be surprising that we see uh, interesting connections you know, between them, because they're smart and they're, and, and they're onto something, right? Uh, and so Kant gets led astray in certain places, but, uh, but yeah, I, I have no problem with it being like Aristotle or like Plato. That, that, that to me, that's a sign that I'm onto something that works. That I feel like there's one notable exception of somebody who's not like this at all. <laughs> Nietzsche. <laughs> Nietzsche is very much, you be actively contradictory, yeah. strive for higher virtues, actively be cruel to people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you literally can do nothing that can harm society as a whole anymore, so you have all these obligations essentially only to yourself, but not yourself currently, like yourself is some like, kind of idealized version, separate yeah. from who you currently are. You to Nietzsche's climbing a different Turn mountain. yourself into <laughs> 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 it's like, So it seems kind of hard to like, have this kind of like rational duty as a basis in response to me. Like Nietzsche was like, no, active contradiction would just assign you value all the things that should be valued. So yeah. Compared to just. Persimicus, sophist, you know. Yeah. There's a whole series of challenges to the kind of claim that, you know, you know, or these people who want to kind of actually actively challenge the claim that reason has a kind of priority. I mean, that's right. Those people exist. They exist yeah. in this region. And, and, but I, I do think it's, the objection is interesting in the sense that it's important that, it's important that sometimes the history of philosophy tries really, really hard to pretend like those people aren't really there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like, you know. Yeah. It's much easier for us if we don't really have to take them seriously. 
Well, when Nietzsche gets taken fairly seriously. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so I was just thinking, you know, uh, I'm not Kantian, but <laughs> give Kant this. <laughs> give me time. <laughs> Is that a surprise, Nathan? <laughs> no. So, you know, Kant at least is using language. Lying is a language-based yeah. behavior. So it, it, it presupposes some kind of rationality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But caring is, is, can be just simply an emotional response. It comes from yeah, some sort be. of instinct. But it only assumes aspect. moral weight. Therefore, it doesn't necessitate a presupposed reason. Yeah, no, I'm not saying you have to have, have reason to care. I'm saying care assumes moral weight only when it's derived from reason. Animals that care, it's lovely, it's cute to watch on YouTube, but th they do not have moral responsibility for their actions in the same way. Right? And if we recognize that, that's important. right? And it's because the rationality is missing. So they have purely emotional care. It's lovely. It's, it's, they're doing what animals should do. right? Uh, but they're not morally praiseworthy in that way. right? And humans, there's this dimension available to them through, through their rationality where, and again, I don't want to say it's opposed to the emotion. So you, have, you, you start off with this care because we're animals, right? Uh, but we also have this reason, and reason can sort of moderate and guide and constrain. And then you get this sort of kind of care that has moral weight. So it's not opposed to our animality, but it's sort of building on it. Can I just ask you? Yeah, and I want, I want. But, but I think it also, the other thing you might want to add to that point, if you're trying to develop it, which I think is a good point to develop, is that the sort of care that comes from this rationality is precisely going to be articulated in not only conceptual terms, but in the kinds of terms that are involved in kind of social communication, kind of interaction with, with others that sort of work themselves out through all of those spaces of thinking and kind of rational calculation that kind of are a basic feature of the way in which humans organize their lives, their collective lives, their ways of dealing with one another, kind of both experiencing and also responding to and providing for the satisfaction of needs, right? So, I mean, the reason why it has to be kind of rational, you know, or at least discursive, you know, but I think that is, I think, you know, to some extent rational is because that's like a dimension of human life that's, it's also where the needs and the emotions and everything else kind of catch themselves out. Right, so. Yeah, that's, that's actually point, because too, animal care is very immediate, right? It, it's sort of, this group you're, right? Whereas, you know, we have an obligation to care about people on the other side of the planet and all sorts of complicated social relationships. And it does seem like you might need reason for that version of it. And if I wanted to defend Bill, I could do it. It's a very moment, but I won't. <laughs> Just sort of the animal thing, it's interesting. I mean, that all of that, I mean, you, you can make very easy arguments that all that comes from a very selfish perspective. I mean, that what we see is care is, in fact, kin selection in that you're right. actually gaining advantage by doing this to collective relatives, but not the question I was asking. And also, kind of, it was nice that you said that the sciences make steady progress, but it's, I find that <laughs> untrue, yeah. but okay. Yeah. Interesting, interesting question. Um, completely, completely other different topic. Um, what does Kant say in terms of. I meant compared to philosophy. <laughs> right. Compared to philosophy. Okay, well, compared to philosophy. Okay. What does Kant say in terms of equality? Because it's like some of this seems to me to be, I can construct, I think, a, a rational, by some definition, consistent system in which, yeah, it's okay for me to steal from you because I'm making a greater contribution to society. And as long as I accept that somebody else can actually steal from me, but ultimately, if I'm top of the heap, right, uh, that, yeah, legitimately, I get to steal from everybody else and nobody steals from me. And it, it becomes, in some sense, rational, right? Um, but then is it not then, I mean, do you have to then supersede that by saying that there's a rational argument for equality as being more important than this? Yeah, I think you you're right. No, this? I think you're right. I think it needs to be, and I think this is a, a worry about consequentialist views in general. It, if, if we're maximizing happiness, well, I'm going to be super happy. I'm going to be so happy it's going to maximize the happiness of society overall, even though everyone else is miserable, right? But I'm the super happy person. That doesn't seem like a good result, right? So, so yeah, quality needs to be into this picture in a way that I don't think it's really there yet. Uh, now, there are all sorts of versions of the social contract 
that try to bring that into play, right? So Rawls thinks that, uh, Rawls is pretty severe on this. He thinks any variations in equality can only be justified if it raises up the level of the worst off. That's the only variations, so it's pretty strict equality on, on his difference principle. Uh, and so since this is a version of a social contract, it seems like yeah, there should be something like in there. I don't have that worked out at all, but I think you're right, it needs to be in place in some way, because otherwise something morally important is going to be missing. Connected with this equality would be an empathic feeling. I mean, the care would ha there would have to be something empathic in our caring. It isn't just rational. It can't be rational. I have to project onto you that you, you know, you're you're have a compulsive illness with your stapler. I I have to enter into your your thinking and say I have to protect you. It isn't necessarily rational. It can be purely empathic. Well, I feel like lots of times where, like, on especially the hard ethical problems, exactly those moments where somebody like thinks sufficiently different from you that you can't really project yourself into their shoes, and you really just have to assess it rationally, seem to be some of the most interesting ones. Like, I have, like, a friend who constantly, like, denies kind of ethical problems, and he does all these horrible things, and I can't really see myself in his shoes, but I still have to treat him in, in a way that makes sense. And I have to essentially, by reason alone, I can't rely on my empathy. It's useful when I can use it, but sometimes if it's just not there, I have to just appeal solely to my reason. I'm not sure about that. Uh, you know, you don't have to be in someone's shoes to feel empathic. Uh, but what you can just simply say, screw him. <laughs> but it is a danger of relying overly on sentiments is that you tend to end up being nice to the people that are pretty much like you and not being nice to the people that are very different from you, right? And reason has this universalizing element that maybe is important here for morality. You know, I, I'm not sure because we're probably, as a people, universally, and maybe this is just my need to believe this, we're probably more alike than we are unalike. So we can find some common thread um, and, and, and experience your humanity. I agree we I can. can I don't agree we do in practice <laughs> very much. <laughs> I, mean, I can experience your humanity regardless of whether you you come from South Carolina or New York City. Right. <laughs> you can, but do is... Well, what about the uh, part we, we consider like a common humanity? Like Kant does believe you have an ethical obligation to treat animals well. So it seems yeah. like I cannot. Uh, there's some, like, some hard stops to me even knowing at a certain level whether or not animals have anything right. close to my so, but you have you have this, you have this, have this is my favorite issue. You get me it with one minute um, left. I don't have time. We have one minute left. <laughs> Let Nathan talk. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm moderating. <laughs> we have one minute left. Um, the only uh, thing I'll say about animals is I've been stressing how they don't have the same moral status, uh, but that's just in terms of them being responsible for their actions. In terms of who we should care about, yeah, it should totally include animals as well because uh, they're sentient beings who we could have something measurable like happiness and they should be part. So the objects of morality, the things we should care about, should include any sentient beings. But the subjects of morality, the people who can be bl morally blamed or praised, have to have the rationality. That's my short take on that. And so I would like to ask you all to join me in thanking Professor Bauer. Thank you. For Thank you for coming. <laughs>